Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Laramie County Master Gardener class. And this tonight's program is on soils. And our instructor is Ryan Sebade from all the way from Laramie and Albany County. Yep, way across the state almost, right? <laughs> kind of. Uh, if, this, if the summit's closed, you might as well be on Mars. That's true. Yep. So I'm going to give this a few more minutes. We've got quite a few more joining, and there should be there should be a lot more coming on. So I see there's a question in the chat box about not being able to find the plot maps. And what I'll do is I'll get a hold of, I'll do the email or the, the website location for all that stuff and I'll send an email out to y'all to, to check on that. But uh, Laramie County GIS is not necessarily an easy place to go snooping around. And I will try to get you to the right, the right location for that. Kathy, I did find this one. Will that will this work? Yep, that'll work just fine. Okay. Yep, that'll work. And and again, it's you know, once you do your your own site analysis for your property, and you figure out where all the microclimates are. Um, it's, it's really for your use, for your personal use, help you with, with planting and knowing what's going on. Good, thank you. And again, I will send out another email on Laramie County GIS mapping. Oh, 
Okay, I've got 601 on my computer. And with that, I'm going to officially get this going. So again, welcome to the Laramie County Master Gardener program. And tonight's class is on soils. And this is kind of a, a takeoff and and this will this will help make everything that I've talked about so far make a lot more sense. Um, Brian Sabati from Albany County, also known as Laramie. And he is going to be our instructor for tonight. And so Brian has been with the extension for, you've been there for about 10 years now, haven't you? Yep. Yeah. yep. So <laughs> somehow, somehow yeah. I haven't fired me yet, Catherine. So <laughs> yeah, well, I'm still here too. So it says something. <clears throat> With that, I'm going to turn tonight's class over to Brian, and Brian is also our co-host at this point, so. Okay, sounds great. Thanks, Catherine. Yeah. Um, well, I apologize if I have to move a couple times. I'm from home because at the office is dog uh, stuff for 4-H tonight, so Mary Louise, our 4-H educator, said, well, you can do your meeting here, but there's a good chance there's going to be 15 to 20 dogs um, that are going to be really loud. So um, so I have one dog I'm trying to take up, take care of here. So if you see me get up, I'm just letting her in and out. So, uh, but yeah, I'm happy to be here. Uh, my name is Brian Sabati, as Catherine has said. I work for University of Wyoming Extension. Um, I'm based in Laramie and uh, cover the Southeast area for agriculture and horticulture education. Um, and so... I always enjoy talking about soils with master gardeners. Um, and I'm a little bit curious, Catherine, um, what, what areas or subjects have you covered so far? Well, we've talked about NPK. We've talked a little bit about soil salt and soil pH. We did the soil in a, in a water bottle and then add water and shake it up and watch it all separate out. We've done that. I couldn't convince anyone to get their hands dirty and do soil texturing. so. We kind of skipped that. Um, talked a little bit about soil structure, not much. Okay. So, but but we definitely touched on NPK and cool. salts and pH. So, and have you covered like the botany sections and those other major sections with the? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Okay, so if we refer to that, we'll be okay, right? Yep, you'll be fine. Okay. Great. Um, well, I'll go ahead and um, see if I can figure out how to share my screen properly. Um, and we can go from there. So can you see my screen okay? Yep. Okay, cool. There you go. All right. Well, if we were doing this in person, uh, we probably would be close to the three hour mark. Uh, I definitely would make everyone in the class uh hand texture some soil we would definitely all get our bring in our own soil and we would test it to see what the ph uh was close to um, and we definitely would do some estimation of what we actually thought the soil moisture content was but we're not in person um, and i do not want to do death by zoom or powerpoint so we will see how long it takes but um, i think we should have a pretty good program tonight um, that hopefully is interesting. I, I think once you get into soils, um, you can kind of just leave it as much as you, or get into it as much as you want, or just really, um, you know, not have any interest at all. So uh, one of the things I think is really cool uh, for you as master gardeners is, you know, learning from this, uh, you know, how you can actually be out on somebody's property that has a question and you can physically grab a chunk of soil that they have, wet it in your hand, and right then and there, you can tell them potentially what type of uh, texture they have for a soil. So I think there's a lot of this that will hopefully be useful to you as a gardener, as a master gardener, um, and when you're out there doing those house calls and giving advice to other people. So, um, and hopefully once we've done everything correctly, uh, we're able to grow some nice squash like we have here in front of us. Let's see if I can move forward here. Okay, um, so if we can, um, let's try and uh, be interactive if we can. Hopefully you don't have to sit here and listen to me the entire time uh, drone on and on. Um, we'll also try and take a break so um, we can kind of regain our strength and refocus. So uh, what is soil? Um, 
there's a lot of different things that are out there. Um, <clears throat> you know, different definitions, different things that we might think of it. Um, I'll ask the question is, is soil and are soil and dirt the same thing? Anyone? I don't know, Catherine, it's kind of a quiet crowd here. I see smiles. I would say, I would say they're not the same thing. Not okay, same. perfect. Um, so Kelly Belden, who always used to come teach these for me when I first started hosting master gardener classes, she'd always say soil is what, what is in your garden, dirt is the stuff on the bottom of your shoes. So, um, so if you're ever around any soil scientists and you use the word dirt, they might look at you funny. So um, a little forewarning, if you ever talk with some folks, you might want to make sure you use the word soil. So, um, so there's a lot of stuff that, that happens there. Um, it's three-dimensional, which is important to think about. Um, we have lots of different characters in the forming factor. Um, I'm just curious, uh, does anybody know what are the soil forming factors? I'll, I'll maybe prompt you with this picture. This is of the Grays River on the west side of the state. Are you talking like clay and sand and biodegradable material? Yeah, so what, what, what forms soil? Where does soil come from? How do we get it? From rock in part. Okay, so we, get a, we have a parent material, which is usually some sort of hard rock. Perfect. How organic else? material. Okay, organic material makes that up. So how do we get from maybe some bedrock that's up here to stuff that's down here? What, what makes the difference between up here on the top of this mountain slope to down here in this valley? Erosion. Okay. So maybe what, what happens with erosion? Is that over a short period of time or a long period of time? Long period of time with water. Okay, so the stuff down here is probably taken a lot longer to get down there. It's either been moved by water, uh, maybe in some places it's moved by water in the form of ice. Um, so we can think about that. Uh, what are some other differences between the soil that's on the top of this mountain compared to down here? What else is different or on the side of that? What else has affected that? Maybe we can think about some of the vegetation that's there, right? Um, we have some coniferous trees that are here on this slope, whereas this one seems to be at a different aspect. So it receives different amount of sunlight during the, you know, during the day, different amounts of heat, right? Are parts of this also steeper compared to down here, right? So we're a lot, you know, lower in the actual slope, right? It's almost pretty much flat. Um, so maybe we're looking at, you know, the direction that we're at. So what we're looking at is basically the time, which we've talked about, parent material, which is the bedrock, uh, biological stuff, right? So what's the actual plant material that's there that's affecting that? Is it something that actually leaches out, you know, acid or something else that changes that? Um, what's the climate? You know, is that Gray's River Valley different than the Amazon rainforest? I would think so, right? Um, then topography. How does how do things move around? Um, so I know this probably doesn't seem like it pertains to master gardeners, but when I go on a house call or I have somebody call me with a question, uh, maybe it's not always with a garden space, for example, but if we think about somebody calls me to their landscape and they say, I have sick trees, what am I actually thinking about when I get out there? Um, I'm probably am starting to think about all this sort of stuff that's out here. How did I get, how did they get the soil that's currently in their backyard that's covered with turf, has trees that aren't native to Wyoming, um, and those things are sick? What exactly is going on? So I like to think about those as well. Um, the other thing I like to use about this picture is we've talked about the soil and what forms soil, but besides trees, and grass, forbs, these flowering plants and some shrubs. What else do you think is happening in this in this spot from a soil standpoint? 
It looks like there's oh, travel cool. over the top of it. Getting okay, so we've got some compaction that's probably happened, right? So yeah. is the soil in the middle of this tire, you know, where the tires go over different than right here? Yes. Right? We can physically see that there's some difference in the vegetation that's there. What about as far as nutrient cycling or what's, what's going into the soil, coming out of the soil, precipitation, water that's moving places, right? So the other thing I like to really think about um, is what, what's happening with those changes? What's going into that soil? What's coming out? What's happening when it rains? Um, is it going somewhere? Is it not going somewhere? Right here, we can see there's quite a bit of larger rock. So potentially we have more of a sandy type soil, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna get into texture a little bit later. So as soon as I see something like that, something should click in my mind as to what plants are gonna survive there. What happens when somebody waters that? Uh, if somebody complains about their trees that are dying and I see that sort of characteristic, um, all those sorts of things are, are really important to think about. Okay. Is that Tara from uh, Wyoming State Forestry I just saw come on? Maybe, maybe not. I was hoping I'd have somebody to pick on tonight, Catherine, because I don't know anybody else. But hopefully if that is Tara, I can pick on Tara a little bit. So she might pick on me, though, is the only problem. <laughs> yeah, it may That's... not be her. OK. All right. So what does soil provide? Air, nutrients, water, and a place to take root, right? Um, this is, is this what most of us are after in the class? I'm just kind of curious. Uh, normally when I do this in person, I get to see who's worried about flowers, who's worried about vegetables, who wants to grow really cool ornamental trees. Where are folks at? You can just shout out. All Here of the vegetables. above. All the above? <laughs> okay. Vegetables. Okay. In town yard. Okay, perfect. And garden. Okay, perfect. Herbs so for not... making medicine and to help with trees. Okay, cool. Well, that's good to hear. I'm glad everybody and just new, didn't say one thing. New and somebody who's new to the country and doesn't know what to do with two acres. Okay, perfect. Sounds good. All right, um, so there's different ways to think about soils. Um, there's different ways to think about it as a master gardener, um, depending on what you're doing. So you're going to get into my brain tonight as to how I think about things. This may work for you, it may not. Um, you may say, I do not like your way, Brian. I'm going to do the opposite, which is fine. Um, but hopefully this is kind of a somewhat logical approach to looking at soils for when you have issues and how that might differ between um, say a garden soil that's been brought in compared to something that's, that's naturally there. All right, um, so as we look at this, um, you know, what we generally have throughout most of the US, we have 12 general soil orders. These basically go throughout the world. Um, they have distinct layers known as horizons. So I'm guessing most of us have probably dug a hole, looked at a road cut at some point, um, watched somebody else dig a hole maybe, um, whatever it might be, hopefully you have actually seen what those different horizons are. So um, they function differently depending on where we're at. They're going to have different characteristics, different things they provide for plants. Um, and there's a lot of different characteristics that we have there. So, um, I think it's really important to consider this. Um, I have a cousin who lives outside of Denver and he's constantly calling me for um, yard questions, things that aren't going right. And I have to remember that um, the sandy loam soil in the back, back of my house and the yard there is a lot different than the almost 100% clay soil that he has um, in his backyard. So there's some major differences that are happening and how I approach his problems are far different than how I approach the problems in my backyard. Um, and for my mind, I simply think on it about it on texture and how that texture might fit into these soil orders and how those horizons are probably different. Um, 
So, you know, as we think about it for garden beds as well, uh, <coughs> excuse me, they're not always in um, our vegetable gardens per se. It might be something we've made, we've brought in. Um, it all might be different. So um, I'm just curious for folks in their backyard, have you dug a hole, dug a pit? Have you kind of had a chance to see what's in your yard or landscape? I see a few people shaking heads. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, all right. So what do you what do you think? What have you noticed about the soil in your backyard in Laramie County? Is it different from other places you lived? Oh, go ahead. I have a lot of clay. A lot of clay. Okay. I notice I can only go about six inches deep until I hit. I can hardly go through it. Out okay. of the plane. Okay. I've got some pretty great soil, about eighteen inches deep, and then it's all sand from there. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, so even in Laramie County, we have some differences that are that are there. Um, so depending on where we're at, um, these things are going to vary greatly. So um, I'm glad we've all kind of noticed these things um, and we're aware of them. So that that's awesome. OK, so for the most part, we're kind of broken up by an A, B and C uh, horizons. Um, sometimes we'll have an O horizon, which is organic matter. Um, Generally for us here in Wyoming, that O horizon is usually in our forested areas. Um, maybe in some of our far Eastern grasslands, we might have that, but um, sometimes it's pretty rare for us to have it. Um, the A horizon, that's gen generally what we're after, right? That's where majority of the nutrients are. Um, this is where we see that darker color that we like to see with soil. Um, do we have a very thick layer of that? Is it 10 inches in Wyoming, like this picture depicts? Not in my place. I got about half an inch on top of the clay, sandy, chunky subsoil. Perfect. That's the answer I was looking for. No, heck no. Um, we're not in the middle of Iowa, right? So it's really generally pretty thin. We don't have a thick A horizon. Um, generally most of what we're ending up seeing is this B and C horizon. So um, obviously more of the nutrients are up here higher. These areas still function though to help hold plants in their place and help provide water, especially later in the year. So if we think of something like that sagebrush in the first picture, the Grays River Valley, um, you know, those plants are probably later in the year bringing up some some moisture deep down in that soil profile and bringing it up closer to the soil surface for some of those finer roots to, to take in. So um, all these things serve a purpose, but unfortunately, if we're trying to grow 10 foot tall corn in Wyoming, we're probably not going to be doing it with the soil and most of our C and B horizons, right? Um, and what we have for natural A horizons is usually pretty thin low in organic matter. We're going to talk about what that is here in a minute, um, but we generally tend to be pretty short on that. Okay, so within these soil orders um, and in these different horizons, we can have different soil textures. So um, that texture might change the further we go down in the soil profile, uh, but what we're re really looking at are clay, silt, and sand. Um, you'll also hear the term loam. We'll get into this a little bit more um, as we go forward. Um, but usually clay, or not usually, but clay is the smallest, uh, silt is the, the one in the middle, and then sand is the largest, okay? So um, as I've kind of already alluded to with the, the slides here, it might be counterintuitive, maybe not, um, but clay, even though it's the smallest soil, soil particle size, it can actually hold the largest amount of water. So um, sand does not hold as much water, but it's usually more readily available to plants. So uh, as we start moving down in size towards clay, we can also start seeing a lot more chemistry that happens, things that get bound up. Um, we have things that have been weathered a lot longer, right? Um, so we might have more nutrients that have been, um, or minerals that have been deposited in those areas over that amount of time. Uh, a loam essentially is usually a mix of all three of these. Um, sometimes it might just be two. Um, so ideally when you hear the term loam thrown out there, we'll get into more details to what that looks like. Um, 
we're, usually we're looking for a good mix of all those, right? So we want a little bit of clay, so it holds lots of water, but we want some sand, so it's readily available um, and all these sorts of things. Uh, depending on where we're at in Wyoming, we generally don't see a lot of silt. Um, usually it has to be a little more weathered to get that. Um, sometimes you'll start seeing it, some volcanic areas where we, where we have some more of that activity. Okay, so um, there is a picture in your Master Gardener's chapter on this. Um, and I don't know that the picture does it justice. I've seen some others for how to visually think about the difference between sand, silt, and clay. Um, but sand is obviously the largest, but it's only the largest in the fact that it's two to half a millimeter in diameter. So that's pretty small still, right, if we think about it. Um, millimeters are not very long. Um, it's usually loose in texture. Um, if we have a big windstorm, we see it all end up in Nebraska, right? Um, it drains quickly. There's usually not a ton of nutrients in that soil. Um, you know, there's a large volume and limited surface area. Um, the spaces between all those sand particles are usually macro pores, okay? So we're gonna talk about macro and micro pores. Um, again, that's, you know, on the first page of your, your handout for Master Gardener's Handbook. Um, but basically those macro pores, um, we have some water that sits on those um, and that's what ends up being available. When we start getting water in the micro pores, that's where it tends to be a little bit harder to get things out. So uh, silt, that's gonna be the next size down. Um, so it's 0.5 to 0.02 millimeters. Um, again, it's that moderate texture, moderate water holding capacity. Um, low to medium nutrient source, um, and basically it's right in the middle that we've talked about with everything else. Okay, clay. This is probably the one that's the most interesting um, for soil scientists out there that are doing a lot of stuff with chemistry. This is probably uh, where they end up doing a lot of their um, work. So this stuff is super small. Um, it kind of has a heavy feel to it. We've all felt that, right? Um, we probably have driven through some good um, clay soils. Sometimes we call it gumbo, other things like that. Um, the spaces within that clay particle are um, actually called micropores. So within that tiny, tiny um, particle, there's actually spots where that water can actually get in there. Um, usually they're in flat plates. So if we think about a thing of soil or of sand, it's usually a big, you know, rectangular, angular type, um, you know, surface, whereas, you know, they're more of a plate type um, particle so they can actually stack up on top of each other. So they hold a lot of water, nutrients, uh, contaminants. Uh, you know, we can have a lot of stuff, you know, impermeable clay layers, right, where they can actually get so stacked on top of each other and so thick um, that we actually don't have any water or anything that actually goes through there. So we can actually end up with a hard pan. Um, sometimes we look for those for different waste sites and things like that. Okay, so if you're sick of me talking already, you now get to listen to me on YouTube. Um, but hopefully I have some others on YouTube that we're gonna, we're gonna listen to. Uh, to kind of break up tonight and make it a little more interactive, even though we aren't there in person and you don't get to see me running around. So uh, let's see, this should hopefully play. Let me know if you can't hear it. Everybody hear it? Give me a thumbs up. Okay. Understanding your soil texture is important for gardening and landscaping. There are three main particle sizes that make up soil. The largest is sand, it will feel gritty. The second is silt. Silt is gonna feel smooth, basically like cornstarch. And the third size, which is the smallest, is clay, which actually almost feels sticky, similar to silica. When we think about soils, we generally want a mix of all three particle sizes. Sandy soils can't hold very much water, but the water that is there is generally readily available for plant roots to uptake. Clay soils, on the other hand, can hold a lot of water, yet not all of that water is quite as readily available to plant roots. 
clay soils can also hold a lot more nutrients as compared to a sandy soil. A quick way to actually figure out what you might have for a soil texture in your garden is to use a flow chart. The basic principles of this is to simply take some soil, wet it in your hand, follow through the chart, and then you can determine what your soil texture is. Knowing what your soil texture is will help you not only improve your nutrient and water management throughout the season, but hopefully provide you with a better garden and landscape in wonderful Wyoming. From the University of Wyoming Extension, I'm Brian Sebade, and you're watching. Okay, so as you can see, I have not made it to Hollywood. That's why I'm still talking to you, but who knows, maybe Brad Pitt will reach out and we'll do a film together sometime, I don't know. Um, so as I kind of demonstrated in the video, normally we would have done that by ourselves. Um, we would have been there um, and taken the next 20 to 30 minutes to figure out what we had in our own garden. Uh, I would really encourage you to do that um, when you have a chance to see what you have, to go through that flow chart um, and actually figure out what, what you have in your backyard. Um, I think it's kind of cool to just be able to go into your backyard, throw some water in your hand, go through this flow chart and actually figure out, okay, am I more on this sandy side? Um, or am I, you know, do I have more clay in my soil? What exactly do I have going on? Now, obviously a soil test is probably the best way to actually get what soil texture you have um, for whatever soil you're looking at. But this is a quick way to go through and do that. Um, and it's really kind of fun. So, and yes, I did say the word fun, not on accident. I think it's kind of cool. So, um, so one of the important things I think to remember on that uh, video is you could see where I was kind of put some soil on my, my palm and then rubbed it around with my finger. Um, and so usually I put a little bit of water in there and that's where you can kind of feel if it's gritty. You can also kind of put it up to the sunlight look and see if you see some sand particles that are in there. Um, and that, that to me usually helps kind of, you know, helps you figure out whether it's gritty or not. So you can also think about the silly putty and different things like that. Um, but that, that's a good way to go up, go about it. So um, to go back, um, this is a soil triangle. Um, as we look at it, you can basically use this to kind of figure out what percent um, of those different sizes you have that make up the soil. So one thing I always like to point out is there's a lot of these that have clay in them, right? So that's a pretty big chunk. Um, so depending on where you're at to actually have a pure sand, um, it's usually fairly small. But um, there's a lot that have some sort of clay within them. Um, you know, for a lot of where we end up being in Wyoming, I feel like we usually end up on this side of things, but it really just depends on where we're at. Um, and for some of you, you may have a true clay. Um, so it just depends. Um, but this is kind of cool. This is also in your workbook, I believe. I'm going to double check. Yes, it is. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, and then if you look at question real quick. Yes. Um, when you're doing this, the hand testing, are you doing just the A level stuff? So just the dark stuff on top or like whatever you dig up <laughs> or mix together? Um, so it depends. I usually just do the A horizon um, for a lot of the stuff we're looking at. Um, you know, if I'm here in Laramie, I know that generally it's not going to change a ton between the A and the B. Um, but if you can, you know, if you can do the different layers, that's always great. So if you can do the different horizons, that gives you a good idea of what's what. So, so you do them each separately? Yep. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay, thank you. So I do them each separately and then, then you should be good. Um, so yeah. And then Catherine, I have not been watching. Is there stuff coming through on the chat? I've kind of been relying on people to just yell at me. Yep. No, I'm watching the chat. Okay. Perfect. Yep. You'll just yell at me then, right? Oh yeah. All that's right. Sure. Good. <laughs> Um, so yeah, no, that was a really great question. Um, are there any other questions about hand texturing? I guess one thing I should point out is Kelly Belden, uh, she would always say in her classes, make sure to take off your rings. Um, she's done a lot of it. Evidently it can pull stones from rings. So I don't wear any 
big diamonds or jewels. So I don't know that, but um, she has said that. So if you're dealing with a heavy clay and you're working with it, um, just be aware that can happen, I guess. So word to the wise. Okay. So if you do not like this, um, you do not like getting your hands dirty, that is fine. Um, there are other things that we can do. Um, you can do sieves, you can do a jar test, which I think you did, Catherine. Um, basically, you yep. see how fast things fall out. Oop, go ahead. Yeah, we did the jar test. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Um, a hydrometer, which is usually done in a lab. So there we put everything in and then we see how fast that hydrometer sinks down on a clock and then we get a good test that way. Um, we can also use the web soil survey. That's a good general one um, that is out there. Um, we can also, um, yes, Catherine, this does have the word dull in my name put together, but um, <laughs> this kind of outlines the different things that I'm talking about. So if you're like, what the heck was that guy talking about? Um, these kind of, this kind of outlines the different methods that are out there. So you can kind of take a look at it. Um, I will mention that um, right now, before I get too distracted, we do have um, a lot of information on the Barnyards and Backyards website. Um, so we have stuff under the soil section. We have a composting section. So if you have questions later on, you can always look these things up. Um, generally under um, the other publications or UW publications, we have other things that are out there, more technical type guides. So. Um, this is available to you um, if you ever have questions. So, um, so there is a um, article there for me um, if you do have questions regarding that. Okay. I gotta figure out how to get back to the Zoom here. Okay, you see my screen still? Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, so Brian. Yes. Question for you. Mm -hmm. In your in your humble opinion, what is the best combination of soil? And as far as like gar vegetable gardening or, or flowers, what would you like to see? What would, what would do best? Yeah, um, you know, something usually around that loam, Catherine, um, usually where we've got some sort of mix, um, you know, depending on what we're trying to grow, um, a lot of our fruit trees and things like that, as soon as we start getting too much clay, we really start having some issues. Um, so my cousin, for example, in Denver, um, he's got a garden bed with soil that he's made himself, but the, the fruit trees he has are just really struggling in that clay soil. So, so for me, I'm generally for both a landscape for the most part and for the garden bed, we're, we're probably looking somewhere in that loam region where we've got a good mix of everything, um, where we have water that's available, yet it's not drying out too fast, um, all those sorts of things. So that's my humble opinion, but you can you can contradict me if you have other thoughts, so. <laughs> I'm on a sandy loam soil and I grow great potatoes, but it blows, it likes to blow. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, you know, it, it's tricky because, you know, some of our root vegetables for sure, you know, once we start getting some of those a little bit too much clay in there, they don't do well. Um, I've had garden soils with too much clay and uh, you know, I've just struggled with beets and other things like that. Um, so yeah, it can, uh, it can be a challenge for sure. If you have a lot of clay in your soil and you're trying to plant trees, is there, how, how far do you have to dig out to add and, and amend it to make it more likely to have a good result. <laughs> Sorry. Well, so I would <laughs> suggest that you probably select a different tree um, than trying to change what you have for soil. Because if you think about how much soil we actually have, the amount of volume that you would have to add to that um, would be dump truck loads upon dump truck loads. Uh, the other part of that is with some heavy clays, if you add a bunch of sand, you then turn it into concrete. So, um, you know, we generally recommend, you know, not throwing any potting soil on the bottom of a hole when you're planting a tree, not trying to add anything else, because if you think about the amount of volume that's there, it's just really hard to make a change. Um, 
And so one of the things that helped me think about this is visiting a coal mine up in Campbell County. And it was amazing to me that they would take out however many feet of coal, right? Uh, maybe it's 50, maybe it's 100 feet deep of coal. And so I asked them, I said, well, how do you, you know, are they going to have to redo the maps of Wyoming for the elevation? And they said, well, no, it all actually, actually ends up being about the same, same thickness or same elevation when they're all done with the reclamation, just because there's so much there and it's been compacted over time um, that when they take it all out and then put it back in, it actually accounts for all that that depth was there below. So um, we have so much that's actually there, um, you know, just a penny's thickness off of an acre of, um, you know, a plot of land can actually end up being tons of, of soil and weight. So, um, so unfortunately, you know, it's pretty hard to change a whole lot that's there. Um, your best my best recommendation is to add organic matter, which we're going to get into here in a bit. Um, but that's generally uh, what we're thinking about um, as far as um, ways that we can actually amend that soil. So, um, so like for my cousin with the clay soil, I've simply said, we've tried every fruit tree we can, let's find something that's tolerant of, of clay soil. So he's probably gonna have to go with some ornamentals instead of actual fruit trees. But yeah, that's a really good question. So um, unfortunately we're kind of stuck with what's there. I'm not excited about the answer, but it is what it is, I guess. Yeah, I, I'm trying to figure out, Catherine, what the equivalent of my job would be for somebody with negative news. You know what I mean? It's like, ah, uh, <laughs> the bubble as the far as they were hoping for the miracle. But yeah, that's that's where we're at. So, um, so yeah, um, it's tough to change that stuff. Um, so yeah, um, so good soil has structure. Um, so we have soil aggregates. Um, that's basically where things come together. We actually end up getting soil that binds together. And this is really important as we start thinking about erosion, other types of things. Um, but it's really important as far as holding water, holding nutrients, providing some good space for things to live in the soil. We always want to make sure that we've got good soil aggregates. Um, so we talked about in that first picture, we had the um, tire, you know, where the tires have been going over on the road, right? It was really compacted. So the soil aggregates in that spot are probably not very good, right? Um, we can also think about somebody coming through with a big disc or a ripper and, or maybe it's just a rototiller in the garden. Um, it's pretty quick to destroy those, right? Um, the NRCS has a good test where they'll tip get two um, cylinders full of water. They've got a screen at the top of them and then they'll put one chunk of soil in this one and one chunk in this one. And then they say, okay, watch, which one dissolves faster and breaks apart, right? So they have one that has good soil aggregates. It's really stuck together. It obviously hangs there a lot longer whereas the other one just kind of dissipates, right? So if we think about things that happen as far as uh, big wind storms, a flood, whatever else we might have, uh, those things don't stick together as well and we end up losing either nutrients or other things that we might have. So a, um, a big flood for a garden is probably me watering over the lunch break and then coming home at five o'clock and going, oh, oops, right? Which happens. So um, we think about it, sometimes our gardens are under more duress and more, uh, I guess, disturbance from us just being out there working than a lot of our native soils are sometimes. So um, we just definitely need to watch those things. So um, what else do I have on here? Um, micro and macro pores, right? Um, you know, with the macro pores, those are always great, that good mix. So we can move, we've got big earthworms, other things that can move through there. Um, water moves rapidly. Um, with those micro pores, water moves slowly. So this is important as we think about um, if we get a rain. So um, say Cheyenne gets a bunch of rain this coming summer, we'll cross our fingers, but we only end up getting them in thunderstorms. So say it's a half inch and it comes down in like 10 minutes, right? Um, if you know that somebody has some clay soils, can you right away know that they're probably going to have to water a little bit extra, right? 
Um, if it's super hot out, if it's super dry and we get a half inch, but they have clay soils, it takes a long time for that to infiltrate in. So um, I like to think about that as well. Um, if somebody says, well, it's rained a lot, I shouldn't have to water. Well, what, what's your soil texture? Um, do you really need to think about, um, do you have good soil aggregates? Is it holding onto that water? Um, again, disturbance destroys structure. So no recreational um, tilling if you can. I do have, I didn't find it, but I think there's a good video of uh, one of our colleagues recreational tilling with a uh, Troy built rototiller making a lot of noise, but uh, we definitely want to avoid that. Um, and really, you know, our soils are sensitive to poor management. So things we're doing, they, they show that right away. So here's my best drawing uh, that I could do for you today of kind of those sand particles, right? So generally these are where we end up having those big micropores or macropores, uh, excuse me. The macropores are here. We usually have some water that's held in tension next to these, um, but you can see these can fill up quite quickly. And this is simply how it's available to those plant roots um, right away. Um, here's my best drawing. Obviously, I'm going to show you some better ones in a minute. But uh, again, we kind of have that platy structure for clay. And then we have all these tiny little uh, macro pores that are in there collecting um, that water. This is also where we have lots of water or nutrients that are there, probably some chemical um, different minerals that are in here. Um, and things are potentially chemically bonded together. So um, as we think about this structure, we can end up with a lot of different stuff. We can end up with plates. It can be granular. We can have prisms. Um, there's lots of different stuff that's out there. So this is a road we're not going to go down tonight, but just be aware that, you know, when you really start looking at soil structure, um, pedology, uh, soil morphology, um, there's a lot of different stuff that's out there and a lot of different ways to try and um, actually capture what's going on there. Um, so here's the 12 soil orders. Um, and for me, this kind of helps me categorize where things might be at. Um, so depending on where I'm at in um, Laramie County, I might look at this entosol where basically it's a sand. And I think to myself, what is different about that compared to something that's a mollusol, something that we generally think of as far as um, for good garden soil, something we wanna grow crops in, big trees, all those sorts of things. So um, for me, I can think about these characteristics of these different soil orders, and that helps me carp, you know, kind of put things in categories um, and then figure out where we're having some issues. So. Um, unfortunately, one of the big ones that we tend to have are some of these, you know, almost pure sands in different spots, but aridosols for a lot of Wyoming are pretty common. Um, luckily for Laramie County and spots where we're not completely dry and we do get some moisture, we do have some good native grassland, uh, we might be in this mollusol where we have some good um, organic matter, nutrients, and other things for plants to use. Um, but for a lot of the places where people are um, gardening, growing things, we think about these aridosols, which are really arid climates. So if somebody calls me with questions in Laramie County over the phone, and then 10 minutes later, somebody calls me from Fremont County, depending on where they might be, I instantly have to change in my mind what we're thinking about. Um, so these are some of the ones that are fairly common. Uh, these are generally tend to be in some of our um, forested areas. Um, so if you ever get called to, um, you know, some places that um, are under a lot of, um, you know, evergreens and things like this, you might be there. But for the most part, we're probably between mollusols, maybe aridosols, places that are pretty dry. Um, if you have a super heavy clay, you might be thinking about this, um, you know, places down in Denver where we have a lot of clay, um, this can definitely be an issue. Um, things have probably been leached through that soil profile. My mouse will work um, down to that bottom and maybe we have layers where things are stuck. Um, you know, we can also have newly formed soils, which tends to happen as well in Wyoming. Um, and then for the sandier part, you know, spots of Laramie County, we might have something where it's almost a pure sand. So 
Um, there's a lot of big differences. I don't know if this is helpful or not, but I'll make you aware of it. And you can definitely check this out on the NRCS website uh, if you get bored. Okay, um, we'll go a few more minutes, then maybe we'll take a quick break um, so I don't bore you to death. Um, you can, uh, I don't know, what do we need to do? Monsters or Red Bull? Is that the thing that gets you excited, Catherine? Red Bulls? Okay. Um, so yeah, we have different, different ways that those horizons might be in the landscape, right? Um, so maybe it's smooth where it's somewhere where there's not much topography. Um, it's been laid out well over time. Um, you know, things have just kind of been added over time. Might be wavy, uh, might be irregular, right? So we think about some of our spots in Wyoming where we have lots of random topography, lots of different things that are happening with the topography. We might have something that might be uh, irregular. Um, we might also have something that might be broken, right? Or we have just some different things that are down there, different layers. Um, maybe we think about some of our areas where we have a riparian area. Um, things have been deposited, things have been washed out, moved around. We might have some bedrock that's there, um, all those sorts of things. So um, then we end up, you know, damming something and then building a bunch of houses and we can't figure out why something's dead. 10 feet this way, but everything else is okay, right? So, um, so these things are really important. Um, you know, I'll get calls here in, in Laramie and, you know, I, I feel like I definitely get into this irregular um, soil profile from time to time, right? Um, it might be somebody that's on the edge of town and they'll have a bunch of trees that are doing great, turf is looking great, and then there'll be a stretch in the landscape or in the yard where they're not doing great. Um, and sometimes you have to do a little investigation. Um, I had a really good case of that where that was happening. Um, we were able to jump the fence and figured out that there was basically a rock outcrop uh, that was across the alley um, and was probably going straight into that yard. And it was a no wonder they couldn't get anything to grow um, because basically they had about eight inches of soil. So um, it's important to kind of think about these things as you're doing you know, yard calls, um, and landscape issues that might come to you. So Brian, it took me a second to figure this out. This is underneath the soil you're talking yes. about. Yes, yep, okay. yep. Right. So these would be plants. So this would be kind of your A okay. horizon. Um, this is your B horizon. Um, and then you end up, you know, with lots of different stuff that might be happening. So, okay. um, so yeah, yep. Thanks for pointing Thanks. that out. Yep. All right, we'll see if I can go over. Okay, um, so this is kind of uh, what we have, you know, um, as I'm pointing out here, it's also in your packet, you know, you have about 50% of the space that's available for water and air. Um, the other 50% sometimes is about organic matter um, and mineral material. Um, for us, if we went and you know, dug a soil sample somewhere in Laramie County, if we had more than 2% organic matter, that would be really impressive. Um, so basically what we're talking about with organic matter, um, you know, if you look, if you look in your um, booklet, it does give you a definition. Um, so there's is any material originating from a living organism, peat moss, compost, ground bark, manure, et cetera, right? So, this is what gives us the dark color that we see with a lot of soils that we're looking for. Um, this ends up uh, being what helps bind things together. It helps hold water. Um, basically, it's a cure-all for everything. It can also help tie up nutrients. It can also help release nutrients in certain situations. So um, organic matter is really important. So um, sometimes we stress it so much, we then see cases later on where somebody will bring you a um, you know, a reporter, they did a soil test and they're like, I'm up to 10 or 15% organic matter. And it's like, okay, that's all right. But, you know, we maybe don't need to push it that much. So, um, you know, if you end up with the six, seven, eight percent, that's pre usually pretty darn good for whatever you might need. Um, but we bring this up because we have so little generally with a lot of our landscapes um, that that's one way that we can really help improve things. So, um, that will be a reoccurring theme uh, throughout the evening. I have a question. Yes. 
that slide that you just had, the 50 yeah. 50, is that describing all soil or an ideal soil or what? Or what? Yeah, this is a general for most soils. Um, it's going to depend a little bit um, on what, what soil you're dealing with. Um, you know, if we think about some of our really loose sands, uh, you know, we might have more airspace than what is actually there, more pore space that's available for air and water. Uh, but for the most part, this is generally what we can use as a general number for most soils is what we can expect. So, um, so the point to this, I guess, to all the, also put in there is if only half of it is available for air and water, um, then we also need to think about that as when we're making water recommendations to folks. And if it did rain a month ago, how much of that water is still available in the soil and things like that. So yeah, good question. Thank you. Um, was there a question? Yep, Brian. Yep. Uh, one of the students lives in, in a sub in the subdivision that's on the east side of Cheyenne, mm -hmm. and says I have a very high water table. What do you suppose is under the topsoil? Um, so they have a very high water table. Um, so yeah, it could be that they have um, sort of some sort of hard pan layer where that water is not leaching through. Um, maybe it could be some bedrock that's right there. Um, I don't it know is if there's- leaching. It, it does leach through. I was told there was a swamp and they brought in a lot of fill dirt. I, okay. I, have, I have water that comes into my basement sometimes. And okay. I have a cottonwood tree that is about 25 feet tall. It's only like, 15 years old <laughs> that I planted it, it that really liked the water. Okay. Yeah. Um, if it was just a low lying area, um, I guess it's hard to know if there was a, a natural spring that's there. Um, I don't know. Is there some irrigation somewhere around you? No, that it's a spring that it, it's a spring. It rises up from under my basement floor. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, <laughs> it's a spring. Yeah, so, you know, you're probably, you know, probably what was there originally um, was probably something that did have some higher um, organic matter in there, probably some more clay in the soil as well. So it's probably holding on to a lot of that water and it's not drying out, especially if it's continually getting wet. So um, my guess would be you probably have quite a bit of clay that's mixed in there at some There's, point. I lived out in Sun Valley and there was a a layer of sandstone just underneath the surface that would rise and fall and that would seem to hold the water and it would almost channel the water like a, a garden hose. Okay yeah so you know kind of going back to that irregular picture um, you know there's a lot of weird stuff that happens below ground until you start digging some soil profiles it's pretty hard to know exactly what's there so um, so yeah, you know, it's, it's hard to know, uh, for sure, um, what you have going on exactly, but that, that'd be my guess. So, um, so yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so, uh, organic matter, um, it does all the great things. Um, it helps hold things together. It's the glue for soil. Um, it absorbs moisture, stores nutrients as organic compounds, um, you know, this is kind of that fraction that we have of where it's all at. Um, so we get fresh residue, right, from things that are out there doing their business, um, living organisms that give back to it. Um, we also have a stabilized organic matter, that's, that's humus. Um, we also have the active fraction. So as we think about it, we have stuff that's kind of always there and stuck, and then sometimes has to get mineralized before it gets released. But then there's also a part of that that's usually readily available for plants, plants to use as well. So um, as we think about that, um, you know, we keep wondering, you know, well, something hasn't been added to the soil in forever. How is it still producing anything? Um, usually it's that stabilized part that's slowly releasing over time. Um, okay. Um, what it provides, again, um, improves the physical condition, increases water infiltration, um, helps bind, bind things together to prevent erosion, um, and then it also helps provide extra nutrients to plants. So it's the, it's the thing we, we like. So 
Um, soil science, I guess, kind of gets a cop out from a lot of other professions where people say, well, what should I do? And you can just almost always say add organic matter and usually helps things out. So obviously there's more to it than just that, but that's usually a good place to start. Um, so to maintain this stuff, which is important, we want to always be thinking about adding it. So um, if you can add it without completely destroying the soil structure, um, that is awesome. Um, avoid tilling the garden every spring and every fall um, because what happens um, when we do that, there's a good, um, if you go to page, let's see here, in your handbook, there's a good diagram of the nitrogen cycle. Oh, why can't I find it now? It's on page 45. Um, so in there, there's a good diagram of um, <clears throat> the nitrogen cycle. So what happens is when we, we till things up, we break things up, not only do we break up that structure, we lose that glue that we've had to help hold on to the nutrients, the water and everything else, but we also end up releasing a lot of nutrients in the form of gas. So we lose carbon, we lose nitrogen. So every time we do that, we need to be thinking about what can we add back into that system. So um, they're doing a lot of cool work in places in Idaho and other um, states um, where they're putting sensors behind um, discs and actually measuring how much is immediately lost um, when that disc goes over that field. So uh, we know this happens. So if we can avoid all sorts of tilling, that would be great. You know, if we have to move things around with a shovel and kind of keep most of those, um, you know, structures together, that would be awesome. Um, so we always want to be, be thinking about that. Can you say a little more? I'm, I'm really curious about this not tilling thing. Cause I, and I had asked Catherine the other day, well, what about not tilling at all? And it sounded like the answer was not very realistic for our climate because if you put all your organic matter on the surface and wait for the earthworms to bring it down, it's just gonna blow away before that happens. So what is the sweet spot there like between no-till or do you advocate no tillage um, and then recreational tillage, which uh, can you maybe, and maybe you could even be more, I'm not really clear on what, how much is that either. Yeah, so I guess I'd recommend if you want to till once a year, I would go with that. Where Catherine and I probably run into issues with folks is tilling to get rid of weeds, tilling every spring to try and loosen things up, tilling in the fall to break up any plant roots that might be left in the garden. Um, you know, these things where we end up tilling like four or five times a year. So, um, Basically is, you know, I recommend um, probably what Catherine recommends and what others usually recommend is if you're going to till, make sure that when you're doing it, you're incorporating organic matter. So um, it's fine to use that tiller um, to end up, um, you know, tilling in that, that organic matter. Um, you know, for me, I don't own a tiller, so I generally end up, if I need to incorporate some stuff, I'll usually end up just mixing it with a shovel um, and it kind of mixes through that way. Um, depending on where you're at, it's going to be different for folks. So, um, you know, if you've got a nice high tunnel like Catherine has in her picture and it can stay warm throughout most of the year, you might be able to have it protected, keep it warm, keep it well watered, and you get more of that to move through the system as compared to a garden bed that's outside and only has 90 days of growing degree days, you know? So, um, so the point with recreational is you feel bored, you wanna make that soil look cool, that's probably not the time to be tilling it. If you're going to be incorporating stuff in, that's when you can actually get out the tiller. Is that, we in agreement on that, Catherine? Yeah, pretty much. And, and, you know, and a lot of where this is coming from is if you, you know, if you're, if you're watching the TV and those great commercials from the Mantis tiller and you see them going up and down and they got this fluffy soil, well, they've destroyed the soil. And, and so the whole premise is to get away from that. And, and in your vegetable garden, you know, you, you need to go through it at least once. And that's all I let my husband loose with the rototiller is he gets to, he has to play once and then 
and then that's it. <laughs> and we don't touch it again. But it's, it's hard to do a no-till vegetable garden in Wyoming without having some other problems. But, but one rototill is not going to cause problems as a rule, right, Brian? Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And I think there's a difference, too, is, um, you know, some folks will kind of lightly go over stuff and get things in. But then there's like the big Troy built ones that, you know, just sink in and really rip things up. Yep. And I think sometimes there's probably a difference between making three or four passes with one of those babies compared to something that's not quite as intensive. So, um, so, you know, just figuring out what you can get to kind of move that in. Uh, I would say go for that. So. Brian, yeah. does that include like, I'm old school and I won't have like a big area devoted to this and I just might use like a hand cultivator. Would that be as invasive or would you do that still only one time in the year or? Yeah, I mean, you can make that call, but I probably, I probably would still only try to do it once if you can. Um, but if you, if you need to um, do it again, but again, try to be putting something else in there when you do it. So, um, you know, there's, you know, if you've got the space and you have, um, you know, where you think you can get it to grow for these vegetable gardens, there's a section on some of the cover crops, which is always kind of cool. So, um, you know, maybe you can have some of those that are there and you can incorporate that in as well. But, um, you know, I'm sure you're probably fine to do it a couple times in the year, so. Okay, thank you. Yep. And the depth is important too, right? You don't want to go too deep. Is that yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So, you know, if you can avoid going super deep, that's usually pretty good. Um, you know, with a lot of the conventional um, farming and stuff, if you continue to, to disc up in the same spot year after year after year, um, eventually, you know, some places I've found you can get a hard pan. So, um, you know, if you can avoid going super deep, that'd be great. Um, if you do go super great, that's fine. Just maybe try to avoid that super deep spot every time, every year. So um, I think variability kind of also helps with things as well. Okay. My, my vegetables are mostly raised beds, so I'm doing it by hand, basically. Yeah, okay. I just, I just have to watch what I'm doing. Okay. Yep. And one more question about tilling. Is this only relevant for vegetable gardens? Because I really want to grow trees and I got this, you know, topsoil that's like half an inch thick. Does is that relevant for growing trees, adding organic matter by tilling? Yeah, you can. Um, you know, depending on, you know, you're planning to do it before you actually plant them. Is that correct? I don't know. I'm just waiting to hear what the best. Oh, okay. action is. <laughs> I mean, I guess, I guess if you're planting some trees, I would do it beforehand um, to get it in there. And when they're small, you can go close to them, but eventually those tree roots are going to spread out. So uh, I would probably would recommend not tilling too close to those trees after a couple of years, because otherwise you're going to start uh, damaging a lot of those finer roots that are close to the soil surface. So um, so for most of this, this is probably more applicable to vegetable gardens. Now, if you're doing a yard um, or something like that, you really want to add some stuff, you can definitely do it this way. Um, but for most of our landscapes, it's usually not that practical to, to do a lot of tilling. So, Brian, I, I use daikon radishes. And that mm -hmm. would even break up the clay soil in your, your in-law's house, wouldn't it? I mean, those things grow 24, 30 inches deep. Um, leave yeah, organic yeah. material in there and it's you don't have to raise a shovel and it's not very backbreaking just let them grow yeah um you know if it's somebody like my cousin you know um you know depending on what you're looking at you can try and do some root crops like that um that can help break some things up um for a vegetable garden for sure um now if it's a landscape um and they're still trying to plant shrubs and trees um that's not going to change a whole lot for them um, but yeah, in some instances, um, some good cover crops like that um, can, can help break things up. Um, depending on how tight the clay is, it might take you quite a few years, but uh, yep. So Brian, does, so a question came in, does tillage help with compacted soil after construction? So, you know, when, when someone builds a home or you got a developer and they're building a home, 
the the contractors kind of treat the house as like a racetrack and they just go around and they just really beat everything up. So what's your recommendation for post construction reclamation for soil? <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, at that point, everything's been tossed around and everything else. So yeah, if you can till it up and put in some good organic matter, that'd be great. So, um, so yeah, hopefully they've replaced it with the topsoil that was there. Um, more often than not, that doesn't happen. Um, so you might end up with that B horizon that doesn't have a lot of organic matter when they refill that in. So you'll definitely want to make sure and incorporate something else into that. And you can go deep as you want with that, so. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, we've gone for about an hour. Would everybody like to take a quick break and then come back in about five minutes or keep hammering through this? Up to you guys. If, if you all want to take, if you want to take a break, down here where it says reactions, down on the toolbar, Walter, just raise your hand if you all want to take, if you want to take a break, raise your hand. If not, trust me, Brian will plow through. <laughs> you like that pun? <laughs> I do like that. <clears throat> well, it looks like we're going to take a break. Perfect. All right, I'll see you in about five minutes or so. Okay. Hey, Catherine. Yeah. So last week we had a the big wind and I lost power the from like 815 on is that recorded as well um unfortunately no sorry <laughs> um we can go over that sometime when you've got some free time we can okay. re revisit that and then I've great. got all the the pdf the slides done as PDF, and I can email that to you if you would like. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be a big help. Thank you. I will do that right now. Thanks. Also, there were some videos that I watched from uh, Larimer County, the uh, actually Fort Collins. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Site, they had some CSU folks on there mm -hmm. and the woman, the woman from the organic conference, I forget yeah. her name. She had one on composting and there was another one on landscape design that were pretty cool. thought they were pretty oh. good. So, just something to nice. throw out. There. Yep. 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 Hey, Catherine, I have a question. Uh, about composting, I was kind of confused in our last or in our first class. I think I read on one of the slides it should take something like, I can't remember how many months, two to three months for something to compost to be able to add it to the garden. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah. If you do it right, you know, you layer it and you've got a good carbon to nitrogen ratio and you add water and, and in that compost, you can't have big chunks of things. So you can't just go through your garden and weeded stuff and throw all the weeds in there as big sticks and stuff. So it's gotta be ground up or mulched up or something, you know, things should be small chunks of stuff. And, and just by the water and the heat from the nitrogen and then, and then turning it, turning it is really important. That should kick off. And, you know, this time of the year, you should see steam rising off of it. Okay. And it should become usable pretty darn quick. Okay. And but that, that water and that heat are, are key, they're important. <laughs> okay. So 
how when do you start that part of the soil amendment like what time in the year it's just ongoing just absolutely ongoing i i have master gardeners who've got who've got their like four composting bins not the not the thing you turn around or anything but just like wood pallet bins right. or cinder block bins you know it depends upon how fussy, how fancy you want to get and i've seen some some pretty crazy compost bins but they've always got one bin where they're adding stuff to it and it's, it's like the fresh pile and then they've got one that they're working and another one they're working in so there's always an empty bin so they as they as they turn it they're putting it into the empty bin and adding a little water turning it i in my compost pile um something as tough as orange peels they're they're gone in a couple couple months easily even this okay. time of the year and i and i cold compost and they <laughs> and they disappear so okay. it's it's that water net heater really key and then okay. You know, if you can layer it, it the brown the, the brown material is really important. So, Brian, do you have any two cents worth on composting? I bet you well, do. We're <laughs> going to get into that in a bit, so maybe I'll wait till the rest of the group's back and uh, and we can get into that. But yeah, you're you're thinking along the same lines as me. So, yep. yeah, we have a a dairy out here, out in my neck of the woods. And so they compost everything. And so they've got the cow manure and the straw and they, they mix that together and they have this big, amazing machine and that, that turns it and adds water at the same time, gets up to 140 degrees. And within three months, they've got finished compost. So pretty cool. But it has manure. Yep. You got to be careful with that stuff. It's all right for, you know, if you're putting in the lawn. So, Brian, I have a pretty hard line approach to manures and vegetable gardens. And, and I, I'm on the soapbox that they don't belong there. Well, I'm on your soapbox with you, so. Okay, yeah. The, the salts, the pathogens. Pathogens are scary things. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm very much so with you and uh, Kelly Belden was very much so on that soapbox as well. So, yeah. Um, you know, yeah, the, the risk is low if you do it correctly, but just something you just do not want to take a risk with, so. Brian, on a different topic, can I ask you, sure. um, they're doing some construction in our neighborhood and as they're digging out for the basement, if I walked over there without intruding on, a, you know, a construction site, should I be able to see the same layers and horizon layers as would be on my property just, you know, down the road? Yeah, you should be able to. Um, sometimes if you can't, um, you can take like a trowel and kind of scrape it off and even then wet it. Um, and you should be able to kind of see what what's going on there. So, yeah. Yeah, because they're digging deep, so I should be able to see a to Z. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, it's always kind of cool to see what's down there. So um, yeah. So another, oh. Brian, another question came in. It was vehicles have left a permanent compaction. What is the best way to fix that compaction on the prairie? Um, you know, that's kind of tough. Um, you know, traditionally, if you have something that's really compacted, you might have to get something that kind of rips it deep. Um, you know, if you're not able to do that, um, really just trying to incorporate something into that to kind of help add some organic matter um, and hopefully get something that reseeds. Um, you know, eventually, if you can get, you know, if it's on the prairie there, I don't know where you're at exactly, but maybe even something like silver sage or something like that, that kind of has some thicker roots to kind of break up that, that compaction layer um, is usually what I'd recommend if you can't actually get in there, so. So, so see, I, I, I knew Brian, Tara was on here. I see all this stuff about trees. This had to be Tara from State Forestry. I, I'm glad I'm not teaching trees tonight, Catherine. You might've been setting me up for something bad. That's all right. All right. Kathy, <laughs> you, had a, you had a question? Well, 
I was the one that asked the question about the water table. I was told that this part of our neighborhood used to be kind of a natural drainage area for the city and it was kind of a swamp. So okay. I, I think they brought in a lot of fill dirt at some point because people told me that when they were growing up here, they mm -hmm. used to catch frogs and ride their bikes through the mud over here. Oh, so okay. the water is here. It's been a better year because of the drought, but I'm just wondering what's on top of, what's on top of the swamp. I mean, I definitely sit on top of a swamp. There's a spring under the southeast corner of my house that comes up through the floor at times. Right. I have six sump pumps. Okay. Yeah, they probably had, I mean, it's hard to say, but they probably have just added stuff to it. Um, you so know, does that I mean it doesn't have, have those layers like you were may, talking about? It may not just because it hasn't occurred naturally over time. So it's all man-made. So, um, you know, I was doing a, Part of my master's was out at the Air Force Base there and we were next to some riparian areas and I started digging through and it's like okay started looking at the soil profile and yeah I mean it was like old bricks I mean it was stuff that they had obviously dumped to try and dry that place out so you probably don't have I mean if we dug a pit you probably wouldn't have a good soil profile would be my guess. It'd be entertaining though. If we dug a pit, we would probably have a, a swamp. We'd, we'd have a pool of water. Right. Yeah. Cool. A water feature in your yeah. yard. Well, both of, both of my trees that I've planted have grown tremendously rapidly. They're, I have a pine, great. That's good a, to hear. a pine tree that was six feet tall when I planted it, and it's way taller than my house. And my cottonwood was a stick, and now it's way taller than the house. Cool. So they, found, they found the water table. They like it. Nice. So the problem, Kathy, on that is that if you ever figure out how to drain that water table, your trees are going to have a lot of problems. A lot of problems. So Brian, sorry, I haven't been able to let you go for a break. Um, I, I like using coffee grounds as an amendment into the soil. And I've been able to turn around some pretty nasty clay soils with coffee grounds, filter and all, the whole, the whole enchilada. Old, old coffee that, you know, doesn't taste good anymore. I, that goes in my garden too. And so the question is, when, how and when do you use and incorporate this into lawn and lawn in our veggies? And how do you suggest storing grounds? Coffee um, grounds go moldy on you really quick. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know about the storage, but yeah, you're fine to use them. I was actually going to show you uh, from the ground up with Caitlin talking about it. Um, I think I put it in there, but uh, yeah, you know, you're fine. They do great in um, compost. Um, you know, you're fine. Um, I usually try to put them into compost to mix them up with stuff, but um, you know, lots of folks will just throw them right out there as you've kind of suggested as well, Catherine. So um, you know, they're fine to, to reuse, so. Well, I do a lot of cold composting, which is, you know, I just dig a hole, throw everything in it, cover it back up, and I move on, which is, which is what I do at the high tunnel. That's, that's all cold composting in there, and okay. so I don't, I, if I had a, if I had a composting bin, I'd have dogs, and Lord knows what else going through the property. <laughs> <laughs> treating it Catherine, as Catherine, are you bear so are you do you bury coffee grounds in your garden in the winter too? Oh yeah. Oh okay. yeah. Yep. I just jump up and down on that that shovel. And... <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's a good way to do it. Um for sure. So um yeah, um, the puppy I'm trying to keep at bay here while I talk. Uh, yeah, as soon as there's something large I throw out in mine, it's like, okay, yeah, no, I've got to stick with uh, grass clippings and leaves. So, <laughs> yeah, so, um, well, cool. Uh, well, let's, um, let's keep rolling here. Um, we'll get to composting in a bit. Uh, looks like Christy's got one about cold composting. How long do you let them set before you mix them in? Um, I'll let you answer that real quick. Catherine. I, I just, Christy, I just mix it in right away. I, I don't let it sit. If I let it sit on the ground, it's going to blow away. So that's why I dig a big hole, throw it all, and, and a big hole is like maybe 12 inches deep. 
nothing more. And, and so I, I put all my kitchen scraps and my coffee grounds and everything else right in there and then immediately cover it so that it doesn't blow away or the dog doesn't decide to pick and choose. So yeah. How small do the items should be? How small? Yeah, how small should the kitchen scraps be? Um, the biggest thing that I have to deal with is, is orange peels for my husband. And that's, that's not very big, but you don't, you don't want anything bigger than that. Um, the next biggest thing I deal with are um, mango pits, those kind of weird disc shaped seed things. And they disappear right away. Avocado pits, yeah, they disappear right away too. So it, it's actually pretty effective and worms like cold soil or cool soil. So, yep. Okay, Brian, it's all yours. Okay, sounds good. Um, we're going to talk about water for a little bit here. So um, I don't know where this is from, probably from my garden at some point, but uh, uh, we've got a young squash plant here. And so water is always one of those really important things to think about, right? Especially here in Wyoming. Um, as we've talked about tonight, either we have too much of it or too little, it seems like. There's never that, that happy medium. Okay, so field capacity is something that we, we generally like to talk about with soil. So we've alluded to this, this chart earlier in the night. Um, and what we have is basically the permanent wilting point. So that's the point at which um, we have plants that start to wilt because they don't have enough water. Um, and then we also have um, this line here, which is field capacity. So how much can those soils actually hold? So as we see, um, from this top line, as we continue, um, we go from the, the sand to the clay, right? Um, we can see that that changes. Um, so we can end up holding a lot more in that, in that soil. Um, and as we talked about earlier, we kind of look for that loam where we've got this nice sweet spot um, where it can hold quite a bit of water, um, but then enough is available um, to that plant. So, um, I don't know why it keeps doing that to me, I apologize. Um, but uh, so what we're looking at um, when we're looking at field capacity is we want that, that area where we can hold just enough that everything's happy, it's not gonna dry out, um, but then still plenty is there so we avoid that permanent wilting point. Um, okay, so we're gonna talk about some different parts of the soil. Um, this is not in your book. Um, so if you want to zone out for a minute, that's fine, but I do include this um, just so you know that it's out there. Um, you know, soils are complex enough that, you know, lots of times we are broken into different fields. So lots of times there's soil physics that is out there, uh, soil chemistry, uh, soil microbiology. Um, so there's, you know, the physical, the chemical, and then kind of the living side of soils that we generally talk about. So we're going to get into a little bit about the um, physical side of that tonight regarding soils. Um, so gravitational potential, okay? This is the force of gravity acting on soil water movement. So if we think about a rainstorm in the middle of Laramie County in the summer, um, how's that moving through based on um, gravity, okay? Um, so generally we want to think about this, you know, for how fast is it going to move through? Um, generally with saturated soils, that's where we see the greatest movement through the soil profile. Um, obviously, the deeper we go in that soil profile, we keep adding more and more water on top of it, which increases the amount of force. Um, and so that pressure increases, so we might actually have it move a little bit faster. Um, depending on where we're at in the world, right? If we're in Laramie County compared to Georgia um, on the coast, um, things might um, get, you know, be just a little bit, um, you know, faster there where we have greater atmospheric pressure. Um, osmotic potential, okay. Um, with that one, what we're thinking about is uh, soil water movement um, on, based on the attraction of ions in the soil. Um, so if you think back about you know, chemistry, um, maybe uh, you do chemistry for a living, so um, that comes easy to you. But for me, I've got to think back to when I was in high school chemistry. 
Um, we think about liquids moving from high to low uh, concentrations, right? Um, so this osmotic potential that decreases as salts are added or present in the soil. So if we have really high salts in our soil, um, this actually decreases. So we can think about water movement through those salty soils is not usually great. Um, you know, as we think about this water, um, you know, what do we do as far as changing the chemistry of that, right? Um, sometimes we might have water that we actually add that's really high in salts. Um, so we can actually end up changing a lot of things that happen within um, a soil profile. So if we have really salty soil or really salty water, we add it to our landscapes, um, we can change some things really fast. Um, I had a great example this summer of some folks that had a bunch of trees starting to die outside Laramie and they said, I'm starting to see some white crust develop on my soil. Should I probably find a different source? And it's like, yes, you need to find a different source right away. So um, basically they have added a really salty solution um, that has now decreased what not, not only what can grow there, but they were not having good water movement through their soil profile. Um, Okay, matrix potential, okay? Um, you know, sometimes this is thought of as the most important uh, potential as far as how water might move, um, you know, through a soil. Um, this is really important for unsaturated soils. Um, so if we think about these soils that are dry, right? Um, this is how those things are going to be moving around. Um, you know, depending on, you know, what we're dealing with in a saturated soil, we aren't thinking about this. We think more about that first one we were talking about for that's how it moves around as well. Um, and, you know, this is one of those things that's probably kind of tough to um, think about for how this actually works. So maybe this last, this last point would be the best to, to hit it home. But um, if you think about a beaker of water, um, or the pores in a soil, uh, the water below the top has positive pressure and the water that rise ab rises above is negative. Um, so we're thinking about pressures, capillary size, how things might move um, across gradients uh, when we think about matrix potential. So this one's a little tough to understand, but if you've seen those bulbs that have the water and you stick them in, the, in your plant that's in your house, um, lots of times this is what's happening for that to actually um, move around within that soil and keep that that potted plant uh, watered. So um, I just bring them up um, just so you're aware. Um, you know, if you think about some of those things, uh, like I guess it's probably one of those as seen on TVs with the the bulb with water that you stick in the house plant. Um, you know, this is what's happening. Um, so when we combine all these, that's the total water potential. Okay, so if we think about how many salts are in our soil, what the texture is of our soil, what's going on, um, we might have water that moves through that quickly, or we might have water that does not move through that quickly. So we've talked about the house um, from Kathy that was um, in a really wet area. So maybe if we think about the texture of that soil, we think about the salts that potentially are in there, maybe that might be some of the reasons why things don't move around, um, also based on topography and what, what actually is there physically. So, um, so as we've talked about with that tonight, it can be a little bit difficult to know exactly what's going on. Um, and most often we probably would have to take a sample somehow and send that to the lab to really figure out what's going on. Um, I also like to think about this when I'm talking with homeowners. So if I make a, a house call, um, you know, how does that affect your, your property, right? Um, you know, I might have a sandy soil at my house, but I go to my cousin's house in Denver and I know that it's uh, a clay soil. You know, again, we've talked about it already tonight, but we really need to think about that. How does that happen with the evaporation? Um, if it's really hot, you know, infiltration rates, is it gonna go through there fast? Um, what about holding on to that water? Is it going to stick around for a little bit or is it going to evaporate really fast? So these, th these things are really important, um, especially if we have a tree call and somebody says my tree's dying, but I've been watering a lot, but we figure out they're on a sandy soil. Um, that's obviously going to be a lot different than a, than a loam type soil. 
Um, all right, water storage capacity. Um, you know, it depends on basically two, two properties. Um, so clay and humus, um, you know, that de determines the total surface area, okay? Um, and then the pore properties, right? We talked about those micro and macro pores, um, how well they're interconnected. Um, you know, if we have that organic matter or humus that actually helps bind things together, that really helps hold on to more of that water. Um, so all those things are really important as we think about storage capacity with our water and how easily it's able to move around. All right. Um, so hydraulic conductivity. Um, so things that, you know, make things different between a saturated and unsaturated soil, um, air spaced, uh, that's when conduction is lost. Um, large spore, spores, how about pores, empty first. Um, we also have to think about water and like when we had that example, I think I've got it here, it's got to move all the way around these different structures that might be there, right? Um, so those things are also there. Um, we might also have water that becomes sticky, right? So as things become low, there's very little water, it starts to bind to some of these particles and then it becomes harder for some plants to actually get that off those, those particles. Um, so all these things are really important. Again, if we think about our, our um, backyards, right? So um, these larger spaces are gonna empty first. We might have some water that's available, but it's probably going to be stuck really close. Again, why are we even talking about this? Um, we would end up doing the soil moisture activity um, if we were here um, in person, but we're not. Um, so I bring this up because there's a really cool method that's out there. This is something else that you could do uh, in the back of somebody's yard or in their front yard, wherever it may be. Um, and actually, you know, once you figured out what their um, soil texture is, you could actually, there's a guide from the NRCS. Um, I would normally hand this out, but this is the website that has all the same information. And so say they had a sandy loam, fine land, sandy loam soils, fine sandy loam soils. So I click on here. If I had the guide, I would actually be able to put some of that soil in my hand, squish it up. And depending on what it looked like, I would be able to tell that homeowner if they needed to add water or not. Um, so this is a really cool guide. Um, you know, as we talk about what's there, what's the potential for plants to get water out of that, um, this actually would give you a recommendation of what you could tell that homeowner what they would need to do as far as adding water to their, to their soil. So, um, so this is there, it's kind of cool. So once you figured out their soil texture, then you go to this guide um, and then actually give somebody a recommendation if things are um, a little too dry or not. So um, that's one thing I think that would be cool. Um, and hopefully that would be something that's useful. So if you get bored sometime, uh, maybe you can, can do that activity. It doesn't take very long, but it's kind of fun to be able to see what's there. Okay. Um, we're also going to talk about the web soil survey. Um, have you mentioned this yet, Catherine? Or anybody? Have you, have you talked about this yet? No? Okay. Um, so this is the web soil survey. It's from the NRCS. Um, and so basically what it is, is you can, you can use this and you can click on your property or any property and you can figure out what your potential um, soil is for that area. So we'll go down this way. Uh, um, I don't know where I ended up. It's like somewhere around the interstate perhaps. Um, but on here, you can create an area of interest. You can either draw a block. Um, it's not letting me do this for some reason. <laughs> it might be froze up. 
Um, but basically you can go through here and um, you can actually draw a map of where you're at. And maybe it will, we'll see here. Well, it may not do this, let's see. And that is not me whining, that's a dog. I'm gonna let out just a second, I apologize. All right, so here we have Albany County. We can draw an area of interest. Not sure why it's, oh my gosh. <laughs> everybody see this okay? Okay. Okay, so on here, I've drawn a map. We're in the middle of Northern Albany County. Um, and what we can do is we can actually um, go up to this uh, Soil Data Explorer. And we can click on different things that help provide us with information. So um, we can click on this intro to soils. Gives us a few things. Um, I generally don't like this one quite as much. So I usually go to soil properties and qualities. Um, and we can actually click on this and get um, some potential um, information as far as um, what we might have for properties there. So here we can click on the organic matter, we can view a rating. Maybe my internet must be slow. You can click on the description and that tells you what it is. Um, oh, sorry, this is my fault. Um, so we can go zero and we can go two inches. Um, we'll go inches, surface layer. Let's see if this will do it. Okay, so then um, with this, um, it did not display our map, but basically um, we would go back to that map that we just had um, it can, and it could tell us what we would actually have um, for those certain soil types that might be there. Um, so that's kind of cool. You can get stuff like that. Um, you can also go to the soils report. Um, and let's see here. Soil physical properties. Um, let's see here. Um, I usually end up doing the vegetation productivity, but uh, there's a lot of different stuff that's on here. Um, this will give you another rating as far as um, what you might expect as far as some texture. So it's kind of cool um, to go through that way. Um, some of this stuff can be a little bit um, tough to read sometimes, um, but basically, you know, here it's giving us the alcova, um, which would be the map symbol up here. Um, and then it gives us the A horizon, the B horizon, and then the different horizons that they've broken out there. So this is here, depending on what you are looking at and what you are after, this might make sense, it might not. So sometimes a soil test is better, um, but I thought I would, I would show you that this is there um, and you could actually see, um, you know, um, that it's available and you can click on a property to try and get a guess of what might might be happening. So um, well this again gives you kind of the percent sand, silt and clay, the inches three, zero to three. Um, that's a little bit easier than that AB um, horizon that was separated out. Um, gives you things like bulk density, bulk density um, available water capacity, all sorts of cool things like that. So again, this is probably an estimate and depending on where you're at, you probably would actually make this a little bit more fine. Um, but it's it's a cool thing that's out there um, 
for people to use. So, um, so yeah, that's there. Um, I don't know if you'll end up using it again or not, but uh, um, it is there. So, okay. Um, so with that, if you don't use, um, you know, if you need more information than what you can get on the um, web soil survey, um, you actually want to get a little bit more as far as what's happening, then you probably want to think about um, a soil test. Um, so we're going to watch a quick video on how to take a soil test, and then we're going to kind of go through some spots to help explain that to you um, for when you, when you have those questions in the future. your local extension office for a problem in your yard or garden or you're working with a new landscaper on a landscape project one of the first recommendations is going to be to have a soil test done and once you've taken the samples they'll send back a description of what they find in those soil tests those soil tests will give you your basic ph the electrical conductivity um, whether you have lime in your soils soil texture and give you some basic information about nutrients and organic matter one of the things that your soil test will tell you uh, is that you have high salts or electrical conductivity in your soil. And in Wyoming, most of our pH tends to be high in the alkaline range. The organic matter is something that you do have a lot of control in. And if your organic matter is low, we would recommend that you use compost, manure, anything that was plant material to uh, amend your soil. And then it'll give you information on the nutrient levels in your soil. Nitrate is really important for plant growth. Phosphorus is important for root growth. Potassium is gonna be really important for the overall health of the plants in your garden. If you need help in determining what those soil sample results mean, uh, you can have a copy sent to your local extension office for details on your soil sample. I'm Donna Hoffman from the University of Wyoming Extension, and this is From the Ground Up. All right, well, we'll kind of let Donna explain that. I don't know if anyone's met Donna, but you probably will if you end up going to the state conference for Master Gardeners at some point. So Donna is a great resource. Um, but yes, as she's kind of outlined, there's a lot of different stuff you can get done with soil tests. Um, when you get one done, they can sometimes be really confusing as to what exactly is going on. Um, but there's several resources that are out there um, that can help you kind of go through interpreting these types of things, um, different types of tests you might get. Um, you know, generally we recommend folks send stuff to a university lab, but you can also do independent labs, um, board labs out of Nebraska. You can also do, um, you know, Wyoming analytical labs here in Laramie. There's a lot of different places that are out there, um, but something like this um, is always great. Um, and so in here, you know, you, you know, for most of what we're probably doing with a vegetable garden, we're gonna be doing a routine soil test um, so we'll get things as Donna's talked about, texture, pH, um, you know, different types of nu nutrients that are in there, you know, different types of minerals, um, organic matter will pop out. Um, and so I think one of the important things to remember is when we're recommending a soil test to a homeowner as master gardeners, um, is really making sure that they communicate well with that lab for what they're looking for. Um, so if they don't, um, you know, if you aren't able to communicate, you know, what you're trying to grow, what's been there, then you usually end up with some issues because you don't get the right recommendations. So, um, so this is really good because then you get some recommendations on what you should be looking for um, as far as um, what to, amendments you should add to that, that garden space. So, um, so these are great. Um, you know, you can always do some different tests, um, you know, if there's certain things you might feel you're deficient in, um, you know, a good example is my parents' house in Lander, um, there's a fruit tree there that I'm pretty sure is deficient in boron, um, based on what signs it's, um, exhibiting. Um, so, um, you know, with that, um, I'm sending off a soil sample and we're going to see if we can figure out if maybe it's a nutrient deficiency that wouldn't be on a routine test. So, 
So these are great. Um, you know, this is on the Barnyards and Backyards website. Um, and it gives you this, this table that or points you in the direction of this, this bulletin to help you out with that. So, um, so yeah, um, soil sampling is important. Um, there's a lot of different ways that are out there. Um, I'm gonna use another colleague to kind of go through how he samples the soil or going through for making a soil sample collection. Um, and, uh, you know, this is definitely something that we could end up doing for most of our yards here. The most common question that we receive in our extension offices across the state of Wyoming is what type and how much fertilizer should I put on my garden and landscapes? It's a question that I particularly hate because I always like to be right. Without a soil test, I really can't answer that question. In this 20 foot raised bed, I've already taken two samples and I'm gonna take the third. And put it in a bucket. I'll then take that bucket and I'll mix it up really well. I, of course, have sampled the top four to six inches. I wanna dry this soil out. Wet soil doesn't travel well through the mail. I'll then take a quart bag, put my sample in it. I don't want any plant material or organic material. I really just need the soil. We'll then put that sample in the mail and send it off to the lab. If you need any help with soil sampling techniques or where to send your soil, contact your local extension office. There's a really great scene in the movie Men in Black where Tommy Lee Jones has a little spoon tool and he just picks up some soil and hits a button that tells him everything he wanted to know about the soil. I've always wanted one of those, but until I can find a store that has one, the way I get the information that my soil has, and what my plant needs are is to send it off to a lab and, and get that information back. This is Hudson Hill, University of Wyoming Extension. You're watching from the ground up. Hey, well, there's Hudson's explanation of how to do it. So um, that's a great way. You don't always have to use a shovel. You can use a trowel, uh, but generally you want to try and get something that's a representative representative of, um, you know, where everything is at. So if you've got a lot of different garden beds and you have different things going on. Um, it might be a little more expensive, but generally that, that can help you um, figure out exactly what you have going on. So. Um, so soil testing is always important. Um, and then you can refer back to these um, for when you have those questions. Um, and most of the time, you know, the reason we're doing that um, is what is so we can really figure out, um, you know, what our pH is, what that soil texture is, all those sorts of things that leads us into those clues of what we need to have um, for getting things done. So um, some other continued reading. Um, Caitlin has put together some really nice articles on barnyards and backyards um, about tillage, um, soil carbon. I mean, there's all sorts of cool stuff that's happening here. Um, so um, growing healthy soil, this is really a good thing to read. Um, when you get done with tonight, and you're like, what was that guy babbling on and on about for two and a half hours? I'll just go read Caitlin's article. So um, there's some good ones um, on there to go read. Um, and I'd recommend you go check those out. Okay. Um, so there's a lot that happens under the, under the soil or under, under our soils, right? Um, we have plants that are there, they're fixing, um, sunlight into energy and, um, you know, we have a whole world that's happening under there. Um, I remember Pete Stahl at the University of Wyoming one time saying, you know, you look out across a sagebrush landscape and there's kind of cows everywhere that you can see mixed throughout grazing. Um, still all the underground living things that are there outweigh those cattle that are on top of the soil surface. So we have a lot of stuff that's happening. Um, again, if you go back to page 45 in your chapter, um, you'll figure out, or you can see that um, obviously these plants um, and microorganisms play a big part in what happens as far as soil 
um, nutrient cycling and different things like that. So it's pretty complex once you really start looking at it. So a healthy soil helps us out for a long time, right? Um, so some things that affect soil organisms, right? We have moisture, temperature, aeration, nutrient supply, the pH, contaminants, right? So if we have something that's been really compacted, we've dumped a bunch of oil on it or a bunch of other chemicals, it's probably having a tough time. If it's really acidic or if it's really basic, um, we're also probably having an environment that's not great for those critters. So um, when we have all these things that are living there working together, it's just helping us out big time. Um, so earthworms um, are really important. Um, there's about 50,000 an acre in a healthy field. Um, they ingest about two to 30 times their weight in soil every day. Um, so that's really cool. Um, they make casts, uh, which are rich in nutrients. Um, so that's also cool. Um, and basically they're, they're used as a biomarker. So um, they're really important for us. Uh, they help, you know, filter a lot of things. Um, they digest organic and inorganic materials. Um, and so they're really important. So we want to make sure that we have these sorts of things in our soil um, to make things happy and healthy. Um, you know, plant roots and soil, um, we've talked about this in botany, I'm guessing. Um, so they absorb mobile and immobile nutrients, right? Um, it differs, right? Um, we have growth that happens and then dieback that happens that adds um, nutrients back to the soil as well. And again, more of that organic matter. Um, different roots have different functions. So depending on what type of plant root it is, maybe it's a carrot or a turnip that we were talking about, uh, maybe that helps break up that soil a little bit. Um, the other thing to think about is um, we also have mycorrhizae that tend to be in healthy soils as well. So um, they help increase the surface area of roots. So plants can absorb more nutrients and water. And then they also feed off the carbohydrates of the plant roots. So that's pretty cool. Um, you know, it's one of those things we don't necessarily think about because it's under the soil surface. But, um, you know, if you have troubles with something in the rose family, um, you know, there's always the recommendation to go dig a little bit of soil out from one of the, the native plants in the rose family and put that in your in your backyard or in your garden space to help those plants grow out because then you introduce the right uh, microorganisms that are there to help things along. So some really cool stuff that's out there. Um, you know, a lot of our, um, you know, antibiotics, we end up actually finding them from soils. So there's a lot of cool stuff that happens underneath. Okay, uh, now we're gonna move into soil pH. Um, it's not correct because it's always on caps and I don't know how to fig fix it for my headings. So I apologize, but uh, generally for the most part here in Wyoming, we are probably in this range. Um, so very rarely will we find acidic soils. They are in a few spots. Uh, we definitely have some in some of the fens in different places in some of our um, forested areas. Um, but we generally are in these types of soils, uh, you know, seven and a half to eight and a half is fairly common to find on a lot of our landscape uh, soil tests that come back. Um, so depending on where we're at, this can be a bit of an issue. Um, so these are both plant questions that have been posed to me. And you as master gardeners may receive these in, a in the future. What's happening with that cucumber on the left? Any ideas? This all is related to sometimes pH or nutrient deficiencies. So Brian, do you know what variety of cucumber that's supposed to be? I do. Uh, no, I don't. Sorry. Not supposed to be a melon, though. I don't think melon was in the name of the variety. OK. Um, because there you, is. You can't, you can't answer, Catherine. You're excluded from this. 
Okay, so this one is actually a nitrogen deficiency. We don't get the elongation of the cucumber that we need. And so it actually ends up just kind of turning into a ball. Um, it's deficient in other nutrients as well. Um, this came from a garden that was an old parking lot in Newcastle, Wyoming. So um, that's what's going on here. What about these leaves? These are on strawberry leaves in the um, backyard of Sabati Farms in Laramie, Wyoming. Could be a lack of trace minerals. Um, maybe the soil is not too alkaline, so it's not releasing the uh, magnesium. Yep, very good. Um, so it's close to magnesium. This is probably iron that is deficient in. Um, so this is something we see a lot of. Um, you know, if you have have some fruit trees or other plants in the rose family, lots of times we'll see this pop up right away. Usually it's not quite this bad, um, but usually we end up seeing this. So we see dark green veins, lighter leaf material in between the veins. Um, and so usually it's an iron deficiency or iron chlorosis that we're dealing with. Um, so a good, good thing to kind of get this figured out is we can kind of look at a chart and based on our uh, pH, we can kind of figure out what we might be limited in. So um, right away we see I'm in that yard of eight to eight and a half probably. So I'm really deficient in iron. Um, we tend to see a lot of phosphorus that gets bound up by calcium at these um, higher pHs as well. Um, so there's a lot of things that we can see that actually end up getting bound up. So um, Catherine probably has once, I'm gonna guess just once, has seen tomato end blossom rot come through her door as a question. If you Are you familiar with that when the end of a tomato rots? So if you Google it, what do they say? Can I jump in on that or, or am I excluded? You're excluded, we'll let you add to it. I, so if you Google it, what are they gonna tell you you're deficient in? Need more calcium. More calcium. Rick, you're on top of it tonight. Con consistent watering. Right, so yeah. So generally if it's a lot of our native soils, uh, depending on where we're at, depending on what the soil we're using is, um, if we're here in my backyard in Laramie, Wyoming, where I have a raised bed and the topsoil is four or five inches, those, those roots are way deep, right? So lots of times we probably have enough calcium. Um, so it's more of a watering issue. So um, there's things, my point to all that is there's things that can, you know, if you look them up, you think it might be an issue with nutrients, but sometimes there's things that sneak in there as well. So, um, there's some really cool guides that are out there um, as far as um, helping you kind of walk through what might be an issue. Um, so these are pretty cool. Uh, Montana State has some other ones as well. Um, there's a lot out there. So basically if you Google uh, plant nutrient deficiencies and then put the term EDU for like education in quotes, uh, you'll end up with a bunch of these. So, um, so there's a lot of things that are available to kind of walk you through um, what might be happening, uh, but nutrient deficiencies um, are real. Um, sometimes it might be based on uh, pH, it might be on other factors, um, but the main thing to take from this is um, try to make sure you're getting a good recommendation through that soil sample and testing that you're doing. Um, and then you can apply accordingly. So things like iron, you know, we can end up adding some iron um, to the soil. Uh, we can actually sp spray some stuff on the leaves. Um, so it all just really depends on where we're at and what we're looking at. Um, one thing that we can add that generally helps, and you are all gonna guess it, would be starts with an O, ends with an R, organic matter, right? So depending on the soil that we're looking at, um, organic matter is one of those other things that can help us out as well. So, um, so yeah, that's one of those we want to keep in mind. Um, Catherine, did you have more to add to that? You know, um, the whole calcium conundrum is very complicated. And I'm actually going to touch on that at next 
Monday's class on vegetable gardening. But it, it's a very complex process for calcium, which doesn't move in the plant. It, it just sits there and it needs oxen. The plant actually needs to be in a growing state with a lot of oxen present, which is a plant hormone in order for the calcium to be taken up. And they, this just came out and I'll send you what I've, what I've got on, on calcium and, and oxen, Brian. But it's, it, calcium needs oxen in order for the plant to take it up efficiently. And once the plant stops growing, like later in the season when, when a tomato plant's just working on tomatoes, putting out fruit, um, that's usually where you start seeing that, that calcium deficiency. So the myth is, the myth, the great gardening, vegetable gardening myth is when you have blossom end rot, you add Epsom salts. No, <laughs> I don't know where that came from. That's, that's crazy. There, there's no calcium, there's not, nothing in there that's gonna help that tomato plant take up calcium. Right, yeah, right, <laughs> yep. <laughs> the myth. Yep, yeah, so, you know, it's really complex what they, what they go through. So, um, so yeah, these guides are really helpful and uh, yep, it's a good point. So um, one of those things to keep an eye out for. Yep. Okay, saline and sodic soils. Um, we end up with a lot of salt issues. So Kat, as Catherine just said, should we add more salt to the soil? No, don't add more salt. So, um, so, you know, with a lot of these, depending on what we need, um, you know, we're probably trying to flush things out. Um, if it's here, um, you know, in the Laramie Valley and we're out at the monolith property and we're trying to wash it all out and we're using irrigation water, we're probably actually getting more of it from the parent material um, than we can actually, you know, flush out. So sometimes depending on where we're at, um, excess water does not actually flush things out. So it can, uh, but sometimes it's tough. Um, I gave the, um, the example early about the salts in the water with the homeowners here. Again, that was tough. Um, you're just adding it to it and you can't flush it out. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about manure. Uh, manure also um, can lots of times be really high in salts. So um, depending on where you're adding that, that may not be a good thing. Um, fertilizer applications, um, lots of times that's also a salt. Um, and then we can also have salts that are in various amendments. So keeping an eye on that is, is really important. Um, and again, if we have a salt issue and you look it up and you can't wash it out, what do people usually recommend? Adding organic matter, right? Okay, so it's one of those things, again, that helps bind things up. Um, okay, so um, we're not gonna get in real deep into um, salinity issues. Um, you know, for the most part, if we've got a really big area that we're looking at, it's probably a fairly complex problem that we're at somebody has one in a vegetable garden, hopefully they can actually just replace that and, and put in some different soil if needed. So, um, so if there's questions, we can chat about it later, but we'll probably go on to other stuff so I don't have too many people falling asleep on me tonight. Okay, organic matter, we've talked about it again, we can add it mechanically, as we've talked about. Um, we can get it from what plants are left out there. Again, if you go kind of back to that page 45, again, it's more about nitrogen, but it also can be related to that. Um, we can also have um, animals that leave it behind. So um, in this video, we actually have Donna adding some in with a rototiller. So um, hopefully that eases some of my fear I might have um, posed earlier. <laughs> Wyoming, we tend to have soils that are lacking in organic matter. And one of the best things you can do before you begin to prep a garden site is to have a soil test done. And that will tell you the amount of organic matter you have in your soil, as well as the nutrients you do have and things that you might need to add to that soil. So some of the different organic matters that you might use are composted kitchen scraps and yard waste from your own garden and yard, um, compost that you can get from the garden centers, 
composted manure that you can buy in packages, peat moss, straw, anything that was plant-based before it became a product that you'd use for a soil amendment in the garden. And that will help with drainage for heavy clay soils um, and holding on to water in sandier soils so that you get the benefit of the nutrient that you add to the soil rather than having it drain away. When you put on organic matter, um, we would recommend that you put on about two inches and then rake it into your soil and then rototill it in as deeply as you can. If you're lacking in nutrients, you can get a variety of different fertilizers to add to your soil and then your garden is really prepared and ready to use for your gardening season. This will benefit your garden from the ground up. This has been Donna Quinn for the University of Wyoming. Okay, so there we have it. Donna mixing some stuff in. Um, she says as deep as you can, and I would emphasize can. So try not to get that three feet down. So if you're getting it down two or three inches, let's go with that, not try to, uh, to get it into the sea horizon of the soil profile. So um, Donna's also got another one on grass clippings. Um, you know, that's another way we can kind of generally help suppress some weeds in the garden. Um, one of the things we're going to touch on with that is um, the fertilizer herbicide combinations that we can buy, the weed and feed products. Um, so if we've been putting lots of those products on our lawn and then harvesting those clippings and then putting, putting them in a compost pile, putting them on the garden to suppress weeds um, by trying to add organic matter, we need to remember that those herbicides are probably still active. Um, and we could be putting those into areas which might be suppressing some of the, the plants we're trying to grow. So um, I've seen the widest variety of stuff that's been left in, either hay that's been harvested and then put into a garden, grass clippings. Um, and I've run into it when I worked for extension in Northeast Wyoming. I've definitely run into it here in Albany County. Um, so, you know, as we think about grass clippings, manure is another thing as well. So, um, you know, if you look at a milestone label, which is a, a herbicide for like Canada thistle and things, um, it's got a great depiction of somebody spraying grass, that grass being harvested into hay, an animal eating that hay, and then the manure left over with that, um, that herbicide residual still in the manure. So, um, you know, I had a great example of that this year, um, or I guess it would have been last year, two years in a row, somebody had it. And it was kind of the last factor that we could figure out. And um, they were reluctant to believe me that that actually occurs. And then they switched what they were using, no more manure and everything was fine. So um, it's one of those things to really watch. It's really hard to trace. Labs have a hard time detecting it. So um, the point being, if you're gonna use different things, grass clippings for composting and whatnot, make sure you know where it's at. So with that, we're gonna watch two videos on composting um, that hopefully give us a good outline of what we're, what we're looking at. Um, I think Catherine will probably get into more detail later on, but this is a good starter for where we're at. Um, some of the main take homes I want you to think about is our climate. So. Um, you know, how much material we have, thinking about keeping it wet and those sorts of things. And hopefully I have these in the right order. Spring is a great time of year for those people who've had compost piles to get their compost piles started. It's also a great time of year for those wanting compost piles to start it. This episode, we're going to talk about the ingredients that need to go into a compost pile, and it's really simple. We break the ingredients that go into a compost pile into two areas, green and brown. Green's nitrogen, and brown's carbon. So what we have here, of course, is a pile that's mostly brown, carbon. So we have some high-quality chicken manure that we're going to add to it. And in general, we want to add one part green, one part nitrogen, to 30 parts carbon. It's really important that we stir that in good. As things green up and we start mowing our lawns, 
gathering leaves, pulling weeds out of the garden. We can add that green to this pile as we go. There's a great publication on the University of Wyoming Extension website called Backyard Composting that you can find. Composting is a great way to get rid of unwanted organic matter that we can then add back to our gardens as needed fertilizer. Tune in next week and we'll talk about the management strategies that we'll employ in the compost pile. Okay, so that's first half. So last time I was talking about the ingredients that you can start a compost pile with in the spring. Now I want to talk really about how we manage the compost pile. When I teach people about a compost pile, I really want to talk to them about the fact that they now have millions of pets that we call microbes. So last week we talked about how to feed them. Now today we really want to talk about how to take care of them. The first thing we do with a pet is give it exercise. And that's what we do by stirring the pile. The kind of microbes that we want living in this pile are aerobic oxygen loving microbes things like putting lateral stuff in there burying it up might help oxygen come in i've even seen people drill holes in pvc and put that down into the pile to help oxygen go down into the pile but most important we really probably need to stir that pile at least once a week anybody that's composted in wyoming knows that our cold winters usually shut our piles off they stop those microbes from working but in the summertime, they stop because they get too dry. We've got to keep these microbes in an environment where they can live. We've got to keep our compost pile moist. We're probably going to have to water at least once a week in the summertime. The rule of thumb that I like to go by is when we pick that compost up, we want it to feel icky, icky enough that we want to put it down, but then it doesn't stick to our hands. Kind of like a wet sponge. Again, there's a great publication on UW Extension's website called Backyard Composting. This okay, so that's kind of a good introduction to that. Um, basically, um, we can use that publication that's there. Um, it's been updated recently by Karen and Chris. Um, and it kind of outlines what we're looking for. Um, so we can go large scale small scale, um, but I think as Hudson's pointed out, it's really important to think about the scale that we're doing things at for composting in Wyoming. Um, if you're like me and say you're going to compost and then just throw some junk in the corner of the yard in the backyard, don't water it, don't stir it, um, don't get air to it. I see Catherine laughing. Yeah, success is minimal. It doesn't happen. Um, you know, we can make things happen. Um, so for some folks, maybe they want to take it inside. If you're really thinking about it and paying attention, you can definitely get it to happen outside. Um, but it's one of those things that if you don't have the time, you don't have the space to do it, um, it makes it really tough um, to have it actually happen. Um, it can work in cold weather, um, but generally we need bigger and bigger piles. Um, you know, there's research out of Canada where they actually do composting of large, you know, livestock animals that pass away. Um, you know, it works over the winter for them. Um, but I think, you know, for me here in Laramie, one of the biggest things is trying to keep that pile wet throughout the summer. Um, and it can be really tough and it takes a lot of time. So um, I guess it's one of those, if you're looking to do it, um, think about the time commitment. That's really important. Um, there are other options. I'm going to let Hudson talk to us about uh, red wigglers here for a second as well. Um, Caitlin Youngquist is another colleague of mine in Washakie County. She's done a lot of stuff with red wigglers. She has some really cool stuff she does with kids, showing them how you can do some composting in your house as well. Um, but with all this stuff, it really depends on how much you need for the year. So um, if you don't do it on your own, you can also always buy some stuff from a good source, um, but there's lots of options out there. Mm -hmm. 
composting in Wyoming is sometimes rather difficult. One alternative to composting outside is vermicomposting. Vermicomposting is actually using worms to make compost. The worms that we use are actually called red wigglers. They're a little smaller than night crawlers and uh, we can keep them basically in the house. When we're keeping worms, we really want to think of them as pets. We basically have to keep them fed and watered and, and exercised, move them from one bin to the other. Here in this bin, we have a bin that the worms are basically moved out of because there's nothing else to eat. And boy, isn't that a beautiful material to use as potting soil or as a soil amendment anywhere in our yard. So the top one has the, mostly the undigested material where the worms are. We can see a piece of turnip, an apple slice that's been added to this compost bin. Basically, we want to use plant material along with uh, some kind of base like shredded newspaper or cardboard or peat moss. Some concerns um, if, if there's any smell coming from, from an indoor worm bin, you're probably keeping it too wet. Here, these worms are turning something that would normally end up in the landfill into something great that we can use as a soil amendment anywhere in our yards. Okay, so that's another option as well. Um, you know, limited space, you do have to keep them warm, so you can't throw them out in the uh, frozen yard over winter, but uh, it's another option that lots of people like to use. Um, again, there's a whole section here on um, composting. Um, as Catherine and I talked about earlier, um, if you can try to avoid any sort of animal waste, um, dog, cat for sure, um, but you know any animal manure we want to keep out of the, the compost. Um, I would also recommend probably not doing eggs uh, because lots of times we don't always get things hot enough with those as well. So um, I would just think about that. Um, you know, do you really need you know, are you going to really get that much calcium and phosphorus out of those chicken eggs? Um, or are you for sure checking the temperature to make sure that you're actually getting that hot enough? So um, question also comes up lots of times. Well, what should I do about ashes from the fireplace? Um, not in the garden. Go somewhere else with those. So that takes us usually the wrong way on the pH scale. Um, so it seems weird to me with my fireplace, but they don't go in the garden. So um, we really want to watch that we're avoiding that. So, um, so I've got just a couple more things um, and then we'll probably just wrap up and have a couple questions. We've gone quite a while tonight. Uh, but, um, you know, if we think about this field here up by Devil's Tower, um, I want you to kind of think about uh, what all we've talked about tonight, water infiltration, what's happening with um, the microorganisms that are in there after, after we've disked this up, maybe about the soil texture, what's native there. Um, you know, what if this was actually somebody's backyard that they were working on? So um, I kind of sometimes like to look at these pictures to think about what exactly we've talked about, what was originally there, what color does it look like, how much organic matter might be there. Um, these things are all always really important to think about and interconnected. Um, it's also important to think about what residue is there um, as far as what we think about for wind and erosion that we might have here in Wyoming. So um, recommending to homeowners if there is a newer property, um, so um, forget who mentioned that earlier, but going across the street to the new house um, and somebody asks you because they know you're a Master Gardener, you know, what can you recommend to them to help protect that so they don't lose any of their good topsoil? So, um, you know, think about the steepness of the slope, again, that texture, the climate. Um, what can you add on it to, to help protect that? These things are always really important. Um, raindrop splash is one of those things uh, that's a really large impact for soils. So if we have bare soils, not only are we worried about the wind here in Wyoming, but some of those large raindrops can also do some damage. Um, lastly, some of these final resources. Um, Jay Norton, who's a uh, professor at the university, um, has a really great website. Um, 
that's available to everyone. Um, he's done a great job um, and he's put together this garden soil health handbook. Um, Catherine, have you seen this? I have, yes. Okay, yeah. Yep. So it's really great. Um, he has all sorts of stuff as far as adding amendments, um, chemical properties, you know, if you have more questions about salinity. We haven't talked a lot about adding fertilizers that's in your, in your section, in your book. There's a good example of calculating that. Um, you know, we haven't gotten super deep into that. I'm sure Catherine might touch on that some more. Um, but it talks about a lot of the stuff we've already talked about tonight. Um, you know, things that are available, selecting um, sites, and then how to actually, you know, secure a sample to send off. Um, you know, the, the hand texture guide is in here. Um, estimating organic matter is in here, which is kind of cool. Um, we also have some stuff as far as uh, looking at some different tests you can do right there to kind of see if it's acidic or not. Um, the guide for estimating soil moisture. So there's a lot of information on here. Um, I'll let you take a look at it. Um, but he has other things that are mixed in here that are kind of cool. Um, rooting depth of vegetables. He's got another one in here somewhere about, um, you do have some salt issues, um, vegetables that um, they're tolerance. So, so that's kind of cool. Um, if you do have some, some issues, um, you know, he has some stuff there. So um, I'll let you folks look at that. Um, but uh, it's something that's really there, um, or really cool that's there that he has available. So um, again, there's the web soil survey, uh, extension office uh, with publications, barnyards and backyards, um, conservation districts and NRCS offices also generally have some good information on soils if needed. So, um, so yeah, hopefully, um, I know that hopefully wasn't too long by PowerPoint and we've survived, but uh, I can answer a few questions for folks that might have some stuff still. Um, and if not, uh, I appreciate you tuning in tonight, so. So a couple questions there, Brian. There was some, some questions about the eggshells and you know, eggs versus eggshells, because I, I never throw away a whole egg into the into the garden. Um, but is your concern with the salmonella, potential salmonella on the egg? Yep. Yeah. Okay. And where I've seen it, um, you know, again, if you're doing it correctly, you've got a thermometer, you're kind of checking stuff. Um, that's great. Um, but I just feel like I go to a lot of compost piles and there's like eggshells just sitting on top of it. And I wonder, I guess maybe I'm a worry wart, but I just worry that those are not getting turned in often enough and heated to a temperature that makes sure everything is dead. So, um, you know, it's kind of one of those things, if you're fine with it, go for it. You've been doing it, go for it, that's fine. But um, for me, I do not throw them in there, so. Okay. Yeah, I, I, as a, I only see a few compost piles that are actually done correctly, and most of them are with the master gardeners who have obviously gone through this course and they, they know how to do a, a compost pile. But right. I do run into ones where it's like, really? Okay. Okay, now I can see them. Um... Let's see here. Okay, loose oh. leaf pea. Okay, you got that. Okay. Shredded newspaper. What's your two cents worth on shredded newspaper in a compost pile? Oh, you can do it. Um, you know, I don't do a lot of it, uh, but Caitlin Youngquist, um, you know, she'll end up putting it in there. Um, the main thing is you want to avoid some of those heavier papers and make sure that it's not something with some, um, you know, bad materials on it. Um, so, you know, you can do it. Um, you just, I think it's another one of those two that sometimes they're going to be too much of it at times and not enough other material, but, um, most people can do that. So, yeah. And, and I found that with paper, shredded paper, 
If you don't do it right, if you don't spread it out thinly, you end up with a really weird paper mache. <laughs> and right, then, right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so a couple questions. Uh, so what if we dump water from a turtle tank on the garden? Is there still a risk of salmonella? Um, probably. I don't know enough about that. Yeah, turtles uh, are, are, no, are known for being salmonella carriers. Yeah, um, I would guess, Sandy, but I, I'm not sure. I'd have to look that one up. I mean, I just know if they, they're prone to having it, I would probably worry about it, yeah. Yeah. Maybe you could water your tree with it or something or a shrub or something yeah. not edible. I just, I get, uh, I don't know. I, I try to avoid it, you know, even with my raised beds, you know, I make sure that uh, I don't use treated wood and a lot of those different things I just worry about. So, um, but yeah. So if someone wants to do a raised bed and use railroad ties, <sighs> um, I realize we're kind of moving off composting, but what is your recommendation for that? How to, how to line that or how to mitigate some of the, the creosote leaching potential? Um, I usually tell them to find something else. <laughs> Tear it apart and redo it? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I just, I don't know. I mean, I live at Laramie where there's, you know, a whole area where they've got trees that are growing just to suck it up so they can go ship them to North Carolina to burn them in a proper facility. I, I just really recommend if you've got it around food, I would put something else in. Um, I know sometimes they're cheap and they make a nice edge, um, but I don't like them around my food. Okay, cool. Um, any other questions, thoughts or comments? I'm wondering about getting a copy of the links, the um, like sort of your bibliography for your presentation. Where can we get that? Oh, for my presentation? Yeah, I can just send it to Catherine if that works. Yeah. Does that work? Yeah, that'd be fine. Okay. Cool. Yep. Okay, well, if there isn't anything else, um, appreciate everybody being here and I hope uh, you have a great gardening season and enjoy the Master Gardeners program. So it should thank be you, rewarding Brian. and fun. Thank so. you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, Brian. Thanks, Brian. That was great. Yeah, thank you. We'll see thank everybody you, later. Later. Thanks, right. Catherine. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Have a good weekend.